Good morning. I'm Sven Cowan, and I'm the Canada Program Manager here at NV5 Geospatial. We're longtime supporters of GeoGematics Canada and the GeoIgnite events, and so we're very pleased to be sponsoring LiDARCANX and presenting to you today. We've previously presented as Quantum Spatial, but we're now doing business as NV5 Geospatial. We're a comprehensive end-to-end -end geospatial solutions provider, and we do a lot of our work with LiDAR. We're about 600 people working across North America, and I'm located here in Vancouver, BC. We work with all levels of government and hundreds of commercial organizations performing remote sensing surveys for many different applications. We perform these surveys all across North America, everywhere from the Caribbean up to Alaska, everywhere in between, including, of course, Canada. So for today's presentation, we're going to switch things up a bit. Uh, we don't have a traditional presentation for you, but we're going to take you on a bit of a journey through NV5 Geospatial to talk to some of our experts about some of the ways that we are innovating with LiDAR. We've all seen that LiDAR technology is evolving rapidly. It's now being used just about everywhere, including our smartphones and in our cars, and its use in geospatial applications is expanding as well, supporting everything from engineering work, utility infrastructure, forestry management, hydrospatial applications, and many more. NV5 Geospatial are LiDAR experts for these types of geospatial applications. We don't build the sensors or the acquisition platforms, but we're experts in the acquisition, processing, analytics, and management of LiDAR and LiDAR-derived information. We say that everything starts with good data, and so data acquisition is a great place for us to start our journey, and we're going to highlight some of our work with topobathometric LiDAR in this section. We're pioneers with topobathometric LiDAR. We've been working with this data for almost as long as there have been sensors to collect it. In Canada alone, we have now surveyed nearly 100 rivers and lakes for flood mapping, water management, and restoration applications. The first expert that we'll hear from is Scott Venables. Scott is one of our acquisition managers, and he's going to highlight some of the new sensor technology that we've acquired and talk about some of our innovations with topobathometric LiDAR. So with that, I'll hand things over to Scott. Hey, thank you, Sven. Hi, everybody. I'm Scott Venables, Flight Operations Manager at NV5 Geospatial. We have been uh, acquiring and processing topobathometric LiDAR data for over 10 years. You know, we've really always prided ourselves on being early adopters of new technology, really so we can offer uh, unique solutions for our clients and our partners. The very first scanner we ever owned uh, was a small form factor Regal VQ820G. Uh, it was rated to what's called one Secchi depth. To give everybody a little bit of context, uh, Secchi depth measurement is uh, recorded by taking a black and white disc about the size of a pie plate. It's lowered down into the water column until you can no longer see it with the naked eye. Measure that distance, and that's your Secchi depth. Since the A20G, there's been a ton of advancements in, in topobathy technology, and we've continued to stay on the forefront uh, of those advancements with the uh, purchasing of the Regal 880G2 and the Chiroptera 4X uh, by, made by Leica. Those are both uh, one and a half Secchi depth systems. So, you know, now you're talking, you're able to get out beyond what's visible with, with the naked eye. Um, we also own and operate uh, Leica Hawkeye 4X systems, which are considered deep channel topobathy scanners. And those are rated to three Secchi depths. So you're seeing a, a much uh, deeper uh, penetration capabilities with those sensors in the right environments. Uh, I am very pleased to announce that uh, this past January, we took delivery of a brand new Chiroptera 5 and Hawkeye 5 sensor. The Chiroptera 5 sensor is rated to 1.7 Secchi depths. So again, you're continuing to see this evolution in sensor technology over the years, and, and we're always out there trying to embrace it. Um, We've been able to do quite a bit of testing with our new sensor. Uh, we took the equipment down to bah the Bahamas, and we were seeing depths of up to 50 meters with the, the Chiroptera, which is just absolutely incredible. And the Hawkeye was uh, achieving upwards of 70 meters, um, just absolutely, absolutely cool um, data quality and depth penetration. Um, in terms of the sensors themselves, most of uh, the topobathy LiDAR scanners on the market these in the market these days have an integrated near IR, so what we'd call our traditional LiDAR channel, along with the green channel. So uh, the two sensors combined allow us to get seamless uh, coverage between the land-water interface. 
Additionally, uh, we also have uh, cameras integrated into our, our Topobathy scanners, so you're able to collect coincident imagery uh, if you so desire. Uh, you know, there are numerous use cases for Topobathy liner uh, data. Uh, river restoration is a big one here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, flood inundation, uh, modeling, charting, um, you know, for nautical charting, safety navigation, sea level rise, coastal resiliency, volumetric surveys, all sorts of applications and cool things you can do with top of bathymetric ladder data. Uh, from an operational standpoint, there's some really big things you want to take into account when, when planning a survey. First and foremost is the water clarity and turbidity. If you are not able to see very far into the water column, you're not going to get the, the best coverage, unfortunately. Um, or if the bottom surface is really dark, organic, uh, unconsolidated bottom, uh, it's just going to be very difficult for the laser uh, pulse to have enough power to return back to the aircraft. So you're, you'd really like something more highly reflective. Uh, water depth can also impact uh, your the performance of the sensor, as can things like aquatic vegetation uh, or algae blooms, you know, that those would call for cause preclusion of F laser penetration. And same with things like wind and water surface or some aerated water in a rapid, again, you're, you're going to get some occlusion. Um, and then if you're working in the coastal environment, you want to think about the, the tidal uh, constraints and, and when you might be the best time to fly. Or in the riverine environment, uh, flow conditions can be really important. So, so identifying those, those right windows. Um, one other thing to note on topobathy LiDAR uh, collections, um, uh, the sensors are typically flown at much lower altitudes. The sweet spot's right on four to 600 meters, whereas your, your traditional NIR sensors are upwards of 2,000 to 2,500 meters, maybe even higher these days. Uh, from a processing standpoint, uh, topobathy liner data production is also more complex and time intensive. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that you're dealing with two different laser channels. So you're, you're integrating those two together to get the seamless data. And then additionally, and this is the really big one, is that the green channel is traveling through two different media, right? So you're going through air and water. And so we need to take into the refract account the refraction process of when the, the green laser pulse hits the water surface and, and refracts through the water column and, and slows down the speed of the laser. Uh, in terms of other um, you know things on the production side, we, we are continuing to advance our, our production capabilities and, and processing techniques. We've started to fold our, our calibration process for the topobathymetric data into our one-touch calibration solution. And we've also been leveraging machine learning for advanced classification uh, schemes for identifying things such as submerged large water debris. Um, we're also doing some machine learning for some benthic habitat modeling. And it's just really exciting times. You know, in terms of sensor technology, it's just continuing to evolve over time. And, and with AI, machine learning, chat GPT, all these other tools, you're going to continue to see advancements in, in processing workflows too. And it's just going to open the door to more use cases for topobathymetric LIDAR scan sensors and, and data use. With all that said, I have taken up way too much of your time today. I really thank everybody for listening, being here, and back to you, Sven. Take care. Thanks, Scott. So Scott covered a lot of ground there, but if you were ever curious about topobathymetric LiDAR, then those five minutes from Scott are a great introduction. Topobathymetric LiDAR is advancing quickly and we're investing in the latest technology to meet the ever evolving project requirements. We're also using automation and machine learning to improve efficiencies of our calibration and processing operations. This is a good segue into the next step of our journey and a focus on LiDAR data processing. Data processing isn't as flashy as acquisition, but this is where a lot of our innovation happens. Our utilities team has been working on automated feature detection for the past few years. This is a big area of focus as we work to create efficiency through the production lifecycle. The next expert that we'll hear from is Will Fellers. Will is from our innovation and development team, and he's gonna talk about how we're using machine learning in LiDAR data processing. So with that, I'll pass things over to Will. Hi, my name is Will Fellers. Uh, I've been at NV5 Geospatial since 2006, working in multiple capacities in the organization. Today, I lead a, lead a team of software engineers and architects who focus full time on building out enterprise tooling and new products, one of which I'm going to speak with you about today. 
at MV5G, we're making a major push to incorporate AI into not only our service offerings, but also into addressing workflow and production enhancements. Our development focuses on AI as a generalized solution that can be used across the spectrum of multiple workflows from data processing, workflow enhancements, as well as new deliverables. Taking more of a generalized approach, we have built out a scalable infrastructure that allows us to focus on what I consider to be our three high value areas of need, decreasing the required labor involved for tasks, decreasing the time to delivery, and offering brand new deliverables to our diverse clientele. I recognize there is a huge ecosystem in the geospatial space where AI can be applied with each potential end user, having slightly different and potentially very diverse use cases. So instead of focusing on a uh, specific application or a specific end use case, uh, we've decided to build an internal tool where our AI experts and production staff can collaboratively and rapidly build, apply, and test models for a wide diversity of applications and data types. Uh, the system is currently being utilized to address needs vertically across the delivery pipeline from data processing, quality control, workflow enhancements, all the way to new delivery types for our customers. One of the examples where we use AI to decrease human labor and the time to delivery is related to our right-of-way monitoring efforts uh, in the utility space. Typically, our clients require a very high level of precision to address asset and vegetation concerns across our corridors due to risk mitigation, liability, and other potential legal mandates. This is a sizable effort to achieve that required level of precision, both the time and labor involved, meaning that major concerns may not be identified promptly. To address this, we use uh, machine learning models to take point cloud data directly from the calibration group to a detailed classification. From there, embedded tooling then allows us to automatically generate vectors along the utility infrastructure to rapidly assess and identify the riskiest parts of uh, the utility system and detailed ports reports are generated and delivered. It's been a huge value to our clients and allows them to get immediate insight into their system status where they can address the biggest areas of risk within days or weeks, as opposed to months or potentially annually, where any non-action in the interim has the potential to be catastrophic. So we also leverage deep learning on imagery data sets in combination with point cloud data to help reconstruct 3D environments, geolocate identified objects and spherical imagery, and further analyze asset condition using a variety of other data types. In one specific example, we worked with a telecom provider that did not have an inventory of pole mounted power box locations across a wide urban area and were actively paying a power company to have those power boxes powered. So they required a rapid data collection and audit to determine all the power box locations and whether each box was actively powered to ensure they were not overpaying the utility. We co-acquired LiDAR, spherical imagery, and thermal imagery via mobile platform and then utilized our AI platform to quickly identify power boxes in the spherical imagery across the entire network. The LiDAR point cloud was then paired with the spherical imagery using depth mapping to identify power boxes in the point cloud so that accurate 3D information could be extracted, including height, height from ground, and distance from other pole-mounted assets. Once we have the location of the power box, we can then identify the exact thermal image that captured that location and determine whether it, that power box is powered by assessing the emitted heat signature. All of this data is aggregated and delivered via our, our Insight platform, allowing for immediate access to all three data sources and a shared hosted GIS environment. We're actively working with data spanning the entire ecosystem of the geospatial space. In addition to LiDAR, we're excited that our internal tools being applied on projects using multiple data types collected from a wide variety of collection platforms. We can rapidly ingest and conduct image recognition, image classification, image segmentation, uh, amongst other uh, deep learning um, opportunities on data types, including RGB data sets, multispectral, thermal, spherical, LIDAR-derived imagery, sonar and radar, for example. We also have the capability to develop and apply models to data collected on platforms ranging from satellites and suborbital 
fixed wing aircraft, rotary, UAV, handheld devices, automobiles, robotic platforms, just to name a few. From our experience, uh, the need for this more generalized platform to conduct AI processes is instrumental to delivering value to our clients, whether the usage is hidden on the back end in production workflows or consumable as a direct deliverable. Thank you for giving me the time to share what we've been working on in the AI space. Uh, we're really excited to continue to expand our knowledge and identify all the new areas where we can put our new infrastructure to work. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Uh, I'm always impressed to learn about some of the things that we're doing behind the scenes. Uh, so clearly automation is a big part of the future and we're actively working to incorporate AI and machine learning across the NV5 geospatial operation. As Will explained, we are building tools and platforms to support automation and using this knowledge to develop real solutions. Will also mentioned our inside platform, and this will be the last stop in our journey where we'll focus on data management and analytics. LiDAR is an extremely powerful data set, but can also be challenging to use. Big files, complex processing, and specialized software can be obstacles. NV5 Geospatial has developed the Insight application to address these challenges and support operational use. The next expert we will hear from is Zach Powers from our Insight team. Zach is going to introduce our Insight platform and highlight some of our in innovations in LiDAR data management and analytics. So with that, I'll pass things over to Zach. Hi. I'm Zach Powers. I'm a product manager for NV5 Web App Insight. Um, I've worked at NV5 Geospatial for a little more than 10 years, so I've had a chance to work on all kinds of use cases and problems with clients in a range of different industries. Um, at NV5, we like to continue to think about what happens to the data and analysis that we produce after we deliver it to our clients. We like to keep working with them and help them get value out of it. That's one reason that we created a web app. Um, it's an easy way for our clients to interact directly with that data and analysis that we produce from LiDAR or other sensor technologies. Um, that also means that it's a great way for me to show you what the data and analysis we deliver looks like after we finish a project. So I'll show you a few examples from a few different markets that we commonly serve. All right, now we're looking at Insight. It's a web app, so I'm just in a web browser. This is Google Chrome. Uh, more importantly, we're looking at finished LiDAR data and analysis that we deliver to clients. And I'm starting with a case that we work with all the time at NV5G. This is vegetation management analysis from LiDAR for electric distribution, lower voltage power lines. Uh, so one reason to use a web app like this um, is utilities typically do have an enterprise GIS that contains things like these locations of utility poles um, and the spans or wires in between the poles. Um, often they don't have all this granular vegetation management analysis data. For example, these uh, canopy unit crowns, sort of individual segmented trees or threats from vegetation um, that are derived from the LIDAR. And everything that we're looking at here in this 2D map um, has its position precisely derived from LIDAR. I'll click on one of these tree points uh, and you can see that we also fuse in a lot of analysis um, in tabular attribute data. I have uh, distances from the LIDAR measurements. I have categories of threats that are derived from those distances. Um, in this case, we have some data fused in from hyperspectral imagery analysis to show this is probably a healthy tree um, from a broadleaf species. Um, so that's what the 2D part looks like. And usually, I'll zoom out here a bit, we use that uh, 2D part with clients to help them plan work, um, figure out where to go, what's the highest risk. Um, if we're thinking of vegetation here, basically, where do I need to prune trees? Um, so I'll go through a simple case, just grab an area in the map here where we want to plan some work, figure out what threats we might have to our power lines. I'm going to use a table here that has that same attribute data we were looking at earlier, um, and look at only the trees that seem like they're not very healthy, stressed or very stressed. Again, that's from the hyperspectral analysis, um, but we combine that with the precise positions from LIDAR. So now I can see in my map, in my table, I have uh, 27 trees in this area that look like they're not super healthy. Um, so I'm gonna go in, look at one in detail, Click here, and I'm going to go into 3D from the 2D data. So we'll enter at that same place. 
Um, in 3D, our clients are usually doing the uh, more precise planning that happens uh, when you're actually trying to figure out what's going to happen on your site visit. So basically, I'll rotate around here and we can look from the other side where you would send in a truck or a crew. There are same trees in 3D space. And that 3D view, the direct access to the LiDAR point cloud, which we almost always deliver to our clients along with the 2D, um, that gives you, go to full screen here, uh, a good idea of what it'll actually be like when you're performing that work. Um, so the 3D really gives you value when you're ready to actually carry out that work. I've identified what my biggest threats are. Now I want to see where will my truck fit? Which parts of the tree do I actually need to prune? We have that represented with these artificially colored points here. Um, so it really gives you the ability to visit a site virtually, uh, plan, prepare, so that you can make the best use of your time there. Know what you're going to encounter um, and know exactly what work you're going to perform so you can save time um, on the most expensive part of your operations, which is actually sending out trucks and doing the pruning. Now I'll show you a different use case from a different industry. Um, this is from oil and gas. We're still looking at finished LIDAR data and analysis in Insight, um, but we're now looking at uh, 2D data representing above ground pipelines. Uh, and similar to the vegetation management use case we looked at before where we're focused on trees, um, the value here um, is planning work, essentially. These above ground pipelines um, run through remote areas. It can be very rugged terrain. Um, and you really want to limit the amount of time that you spend um, sending vehicles and crews out into these very difficult to reach areas to repair things. Um, remote sensing like LIDAR can give you a good idea of what to expect and whether you see a risk at a particular place. So the challenge that we're looking at here in this uh, 2D data, again, derived from the LIDAR, um, is are the horizontal supports represented by these black lines in the map shifting underneath the pipelines that they're carrying or supporting. So we have LIDAR measurements again here, a slope in degrees, and you can actually visualize the uh, support hull in here too. I'm going to look at the slope in 3D. Um, we can see uh, in the LIDAR classification, take this into full screen, um, we can see it represented in blue, the support we're actually analyzing underneath the pipeline that's in yellow or pipelines. Uh, and we've got that measurement, the 4.6 degrees here. So again, I can visit the site virtually, um, have an expert from my team analyze whether this is really a risk. I can see the precise LIDAR measurements in here and compare it to the ground characteristics, which we can also see in the point cloud. Uh, and really what I'm doing here, how will I get value is I'm going to turn determine whether in fact this is a risk. Do I need to spend time and money sending a crew out to repair something or even to just inspect it here? I have one more fun data example to show you today. Um, we had a nice presentation earlier about topobathymetric LIDAR data, so I have a riverine example. Um, I picked an intentionally dramatic site here on the Willamette River. This is Willamette Falls, so a waterfall in the middle of a big river here. And uh, I can show you what the finished data looks like. Um, so I turned on some satellite imagery here to start with so you can get an idea of what this site looks like. When I turn it off, um, we can see an elevation raster made from the topobathy LIDAR data actually seen underneath the river surface. Um, and when our clients interact with Topobathy data in a web app, they're most often reviewing data that's in progress, giving us uh, notes or comments on how to perfect it for the project, um, or maybe downloading it out of here, which we support in Insight, um, but typically used for hydrographic modeling or flood mapping um, that's going to happen in expert tools, not probably in a web app like this. Um, but web app's great for showing you the finished data. So I will jump into 3D again. And I have uh, all of the LiDAR points on in here right now. Zoom out a little bit and show you. You know, we can capture a lot, um, scale up to huge projects uh, in a web app like this. Um, but we just specifically want to look at topobathy. So I'm going to turn off the water and the ground. Um, and now we can see at this waterfall site the great definition that we get even in the bottom of the river from the topobathymetric sensor. Um, so there's that dramatic height drop off from the waterfall. And we can see the topobathy bottom data combined with the ground at the points uh, where there wasn't water above the surface here. Um, so again, just a, 
a great example of what you can capture with LIDAR um, and another example of what our data looks like when it's finished and we send it off to clients. I hope that gives you a good idea of what it looks like when we deliver finished LIDAR data and analysis to our clients. Even with just those three examples, you can see there's a wide variation um, in how the data can look and what questions we can answer with it. Thanks for having me today. And now I'll pass it back to Sven to wrap up. Thanks, Zach. Those are great demos, and it's always cool to see live our point clouds displayed in Insight. So this brings us to the end of the journey, but just a quick recap of some of the innovations we heard about from our MV5 geospatial experts. Number one, we're always making significant investments in new LiDAR sensor technology, especially topobathometric LiDAR. Number two, we're actively working to leverage automation and machine learning to improve efficiency across the organization and to create new solutions for our clients. And lastly, our Insight web application is a simplified data management and analysis platform to facilitate LiDAR use and analysis, and it supports many different use cases. We're always looking for improvements and we're always available to collaborate. If you heard something that sparked interest, then please reach out. I'll be at LiDAR Canx for the next two days and it'd be great to hear from you. Please also check out our website at nv5.com where we have more links to articles and interviews with our experts and downloadable media for our full suite of solutions. Thanks very much for your time and enjoy the rest of LiDAR Canx 2023. Have a great day. Nice fan. Nice to see you and a great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Good to see you again. Some of our audience had put some questions in here. NV5 Geospatial seems to be growing in a few different areas. What will be the new areas of focus in the next few years? These are always uh, challenging questions, I find, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, it is a good question. Um, we are evolving in a number of different ways. I think on the sensor side, you know, certainly topobathometric LIDAR is an area where we'll continue to expand. Um, there's some new platforms we're exploring, uh, robots like autonomous rovers for substation type work, hmm. uh, as well as uh, different um, uh, terrestrial scanners doing more kind of scan to BIM type of type of work. Okay. Um, and I think, yeah, more on the application side, you know, a lot of focus on utility work, um, mm -hmm. automated feature recognition from from different remote sensing technologies, and and more hydrospatial work. You know, elevation derived hydrography, um, uh, submerged aquatic vegetation mapping, similar stuff to actually what I think you've been working on lately. So right. there's some overlap there. Yeah. Yeah. No, interesting. Uh, here's one that's a little more specific. Can you speak to your vegetation segmentation process? What does that workflow look like? Uh, software you used, for example. Yeah. Okay. Put you on yeah. the spot here, Sven. Yeah. <laughs> that one's um, a, a little more involved. Um, we, we do use a lot of different software. Um, I know that for a lot of the, the work that we're doing for image segmentation and that type of work, it is with pr pr proprietary algorithms that we've developed in some of the MATLAB platforms and that type of thing. Um, that might be a conversation that's we better it would be better to have offline so you know certainly um if there's more color in terms of you know the application and maybe the area and the type of uh, vegetation that might be the focus there would be very interested to learn more about that um i guess in terms of the equipment for some of the examples that were shown for the the vegetation segmentation a lot of that was mobile so okay. um mobile platforms with uh coincident uh, LIDAR and spherical imagery. Uh, so, so that's how we built a lot of those data sets that were, were shown in some of the demos. Great. So I think you've answered that other question, you know, what equipment did you use to get those trees? Um, was there airborne in there as well, perhaps? Uh, I mean, they looked like full canopy. Yeah. Um, in that scenario, there was a, a yeah. lot of the, the stuff that was taken uh, from that distribution area was was mobile, but there was also a coincident um, airborne collection to get the tops of the crowns as well. Okay, uh, I see there's another one here. Uh, is NV5 using multi-beam echo sounding and airborne LIDAR for bathymetry surveys together? 
Yeah, um, we, we are. We do have a, a group that does sonar. Um, a, a lot of it can be offshore or deep water, but we've also got some um, systems that work in near shore and river environments as well. So we do have experience using those two technologies together to get full profile uh, to cover any voids that uh, the, the LIDAR systems may not have been able to capture. So we, we do have experience with that. Okay. Uh, there's some questions here about the, uh, the AI and the, the segmentation uh, component. So what, what skills should we all be learning to prepare for the industry, keeping with AI in mind? Um, and then the next one was about, uh, again, back to segmentation. I think you've, you've, you've commented on that already. So what is your comment about AI? Yeah, I mean, well, it's definitely uh, a, lo a lot of work in this area, and we're focusing on it a lot. Uh, we know that this is going to be a way to gain efficiency, uh, certainly in our operation. Um, most of our team that is working on on that side of, of what we do are, are software engineers. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of their background. Um, you know, of course, it does help that they understand remote sensing technology and a lot of the basics of how those systems work. Uh, but it is a lot of software skills and development skills that are, are creating a lot of those uh, solutions and innovations in, in the N5 geospatial team. Uh, very good. Uh, I have one personal question, Span. How do I how do I get on that Bahamas gig? Yeah, right. Um, I think we're all trying to get on that Bahamas gig. Uh, but yeah, no, that was the great testing on the new system. Uh, we were very impressed with the results. Of course, that's you know an ideal environment for. Uh, that type of uh, topobathometric lidar system, but we're excited to start using it in other environments as well. Yeah, some pretty impressive depth penetration numbers. Very great, great. Um, I have a few other questions here. The the thermal application I thought was quite interesting with the uh, uh, the power box and the and the power lines. So. Um, obviously, your company sees a lot of value in the integration of different sensors to try to answer your clients' questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we do have a few different thermal sensors. Um, so that in the utility space, uh, certainly in distribution networks, we see that one a lot, a lot of pole loading type of applications and thermal data sets can certainly tell you whether you know something is functioning or not. Uh, we do other projects using thermal uh, for uh, ground seepage and that type of application around um, different energy facilities. Hmm. So, so that's an application where you know we've we've seen interest um, certainly on the environmental side of those types of operations. 